start. All right. So uh, yeah. good morning, everyone. And we'll be discussing chapter nine. Okay. Mm -hmm. The title is Decision Trees. And uh, okay. So these are the learning objectives according to the sections of this uh, chapter. We're going to talk about the structure of the decision tree, the partitioning, mm -hmm. how the how the data is partitioned along the decision tree, how deep uh, you should go, <laughs> uh, mm. or how um, you know how uh, how complex your tree should mm. be in terms of the depth. Uh, then we're going to apply that uh, theory to the Ames mm. housing that we are being we have been uh, we have been um, uh, you know. Uh, applying the other the previous algorithms. Hmm. Uh, there's a chapter on feature interpretation, in other words, uh, variable importance, hmm. and the final thoughts. If we have time, I also included, not in the notes, but as a script, I also included uh, the application of decision trees on a classification uh, hmm. problem. And we are, uh, we are taking there the attrition uh, data. So hmm. if we have time, Maybe we can, you know, we'll go through this. Mm. Okay, so let's start. So the, the decision, decision tree is the most simplest of the three uh, base models, right? And it's a class, the tree based model is a class of what is called non-parametric algorithms. In other words, it just uses the data. Uh, it doesn't use any uh, parameter from the data uh, to do the, at least to do the splittings. And what it does is that it works, the decision tree works by partitioning the feature space, right? Into a number of smaller non-overlapping regions. In other words, it's going to be segmenting that feature space into regions that eventually are going to be our predictions. Uh, with similar response values using a set of splitting uh, rules, okay? So the advantages of this, uh, this algorithm is that it can handle very well uh, nonlinear relationships. And in the real world, we're going to see that most of the relationships that we encounter uh, between the response and the predictors or within the predictors, uh, usually they're nonlinear. In other words, we're not, we're not don't live in a linear world. <laughs> then the second one is interpretability. The, as you will see, decision trees provides very easily understandable rules that can be visualized through three diagrams and is robust to outliers. There's another advantage also. And uh, if, if we go back to the previous chapters, we saw that, for example, in uh, ordinary linear regression and logistic regression in particular, we had to do some pre-processing, remember? Uh, we mm -hmm. had to standardize our variables, we have to one hot and cold. We have to do a couple of things before uh, the algorithm can then, you know, ingest right the that that data. In the in the decision tree, in particular, you don't need uh, basically any any pre-processing. Okay, uh, probably the you know the the most simple, like for example, you know, uh, take away constant columns and you know uh, check your data that is tidy. But basically that, that's it. So that's another advantage. And you will see also that in neural networks, apart from standardizing your variables, basically that's all the pre-processing uh, usually that, that you need. Okay, so what about the disadvantages? Okay, well, uh, you know, there's no, there's no uh, free lunch here. <laughs> uh, one of the disadvantages, and it's a very, you know, very uh, peculiar disadvantage is uh, overfitting, all right? So, uh, especially when the tree, uh, decision tree goes uh, deep and complex. So it tends to overfit. In other words, it tends to uh, uh, learn so much from the training set that then the new data, uh, it has problems uh, trying to get a, you know, a, good, uh, a good metric. Uh, also in the handling of continuous variables, we will see that it's not as, as effective, okay, because you're going to see in the Ames housing example that the predictions are basically the average of that cluster of that space that the algorithm you know, 
uh, partition within. So in continuous variable, it's not going to be that effective. It's going to be more effective in classification, okay? Uh, also, there could be some instability, right? Uh, in the decision tree, the decision tree can be sensitive to small changes of data, right? Because of the, of the internal mechanism to do the, the splitting. And they, uh, uh, they uh, uh, have a, a lack, you know, a lack of uh, predictive power compared to more complex algorithms like neural networks or uh, gradient uh, boosting machines. So some of these uh, disadvantages can be mitigated, right? And we'll see that some of these uh, uh, techniques, you know, to to at least uh, 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 alleviate the overfitting is uh, the pruning. Uh, also, uh, we can do assemble methods like random forest, which is based on decision trees. It's just a bunch of you know bunch of trees, and you get a voting at the end mechanism, and then using also uh, gradient boosting algorithms such as uh, XGBoost. Okay. Any questions about the advantages and disadvantages? No, Very nothing. This, yeah, all clear. Good. Okay. Excellent. Okay, so what is the decision tree? Uh, if you can picture a, a regular tree, right? The regular tree has the roots, it has the branches, it has the leaves, right? Well, this one is kind of inverse, okay? We start with the root node, uh, which depending on the, on the type of problem that we are dealing with, if it's a, for example, if it's a classification, that root node is going to be the most purest, let's correct, look at that way, the most purest variable within the response. Okay, so there's an internal mechanism within the decision tree that you know is is uh, you know it measures the gene coefficient of of impurity. So the less impure your variable is to the response, that's going to be the candidate for that uh, root node. Okay, if you want, I'm not going to delve too much into the the the, the you know the, the detailed theory of the decision tree, but there's some excellence. Uh, 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 videos from StackQuest explaining very in detail how the decision tree internally works. Okay, and I, uh, uh, I, uh, you know, uh, included some links for the regression and for classification, you know, uh, type problems. Okay, and it explains it really well. In fact, you know, he always, you know, does his music and he's, you know. A little de -do -de -do -de -do -de -do. okay, so it's, it's very it's, it's very enjoyable. Anyway, so that root node eventually is going to be split into two groups, okay. So for example, let's say that our root node, if you remember the aims, let's say that the gross living area, the gross living area is your root node. So the gross living area is a continuous variable, right? So it's going to take the the value of that group of a uh, uh, gross living area that is going to minimize the sum of the square you know, errors, right? The, the residuals, the residual squares, the sum of the residual squares is going to try different values, different values within that range. And then it's going to establish, okay, this is the value from the gross living area that is going to split this and it minimizes uh, the, the SSE, the sum of the square uh, errors. So what happens is that from that value, then you're going to have observations less than that value on the response, right? So that's going to be the yes, right? You know, it, it complies with that with that rule. The yes is going to be to the left, and the no's, in other words, the ones that are over that value is going to be to the right. Okay, so that's how we start building our tree. Eventually, eventually, we're going to have we're going to we're not going to be able to split, you know, those variables, and eventually we're going to have what, we, what is called a terminal node. Those terminal nodes that are also the leaf nodes, those are your predictions. Okay, so if the data, new data comes, and is let's say that the gross living area is above 
you know, the threshold value and it keeps going through the, you know, through the different values, eventually it's going to land into a terminal node. And that's going to be your prediction for that observation, okay? As, as I said, you know, uh, if you uh, watch those videos, which I highly recommend, they will tell you exactly how those, you know, root nodes work, how the decision nodes are created. Uh, sometimes you can manipulate how many, what's the minimum observations that you need in that terminal node? And that controls the depth of the, of the tree. For example, you can say that I only want a minimum of 10 observations within that terminal node. So when it crosses that number of observations, it go, it's going to stop splitting. Because if not, it will keep splitting. Okay, and then you will have a very deep tree that is prone to overfitting, okay? So any questions so far about the structure of the decision trees? No, it's good, yeah. Good? Okay, excellent. Okay, so in the partitioning, uh, what we're using, the decision tree is using what is called a CART algorithm, which is classification and regression tree. And what it does is that it uses what is called binary, recursive partition. In other words, that variable that is going to begin the root node is going to be segmented, the space of that variable is going to be segmented in two groups, okay? And then subsequently, the rest of the variables are going to be treated in the same way. So if it's a regression problem, in other words, our response is a continuous variable, uh, the function that determines that value that is going to be used, the, th the threshold that is going to be used for partitioning that particular variable is going to be defined by the sum of the square errors, okay? Or the, of the sum of the square you know, residuals, right? And the formula, as you can see, has two components, right? It has uh, y, uh, yi, uh, subscript i minus c1 and yi minus c2. This represents the two groups that we are you know, splitting you know, the space, okay? So we're going to calculate the residuals for when the variable, for example, is less, in a, is, if it's a continuous variable, is less than, right? It's less than a certain value. And then the other group that is above that, that value, that threshold value. So we're going to combine those sums of the residuals and then get a number. When you get the minimum, depending on the value, when you get the minimum, then you get a, a metric, a metric of, of, of uh, you know, of uh, how close is your threshold value, the variable to the target, okay? So when you minimize this, you are trying to see which are the candidates that are going to be on top of that decision tree, right? So the variable that has the minimum uh, uh, sum of square errors for a regression problem, that variable is going to be the root. And then it's going to, you know, keep on with the second variable, the third variable, et cetera, all right? And we're going to see, you know, some examples in that. So for classification problems, uh, I talk about the impurity, the measure of impurity, the Gini index. So because we're dealing with labels here, what we have to do is try to see which of those categorical variables is less impure according to the response we see, which is a classification. So the less impure is going to be the root, the root node, the, the, the variable that is candidate for the root node and then the second, the third, and so forth, okay? Uh, so ha having, having found that best feature split combination, the data is always being partitioned into regions, right? So we, we start with a root node, okay? We partition that in two, two groups, and then subsequently, depending on how many variables we have, we're going to be continuing partitioning until we get our, our terminal nodes, our leaf, uh, notes, okay? Um, and for example, uh, you have to be, like I said, you have to be aware of the depth of the decision tree because deeper decision trees tend to, you know, overfit. Uh, so you have to have a, like a trade balance between that bias and variance, a trade-off. You have to have that balance to know how, you know, deep your decision tree should be to avoid 
the overfitting on to, or, or at least to minimize the overfitting because usually there, there's going to be some overfitting. All right. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Okay, good. Any any comments, questions? Yeah, it's a good night. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And the okay. option here to write. Uh, yeah, here. Okay. So yeah. uh, basically like the I function. Uh-huh. What was that the function? Uh, uh this is a function. So it's like uh -huh. it that for example, we are making the first split, and I make mm -hmm. the split here. So what it does is to check right. uh, based on this prediction how much of the the yeah. error we have for each split. Correct. Yes. And the error is going to be computed uh, with the average of that group of, 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 of features, the average against each of the observations. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, this is an average. Exactly. Okay. Or, or more, or also the, the mode, if it's a classification. If it, if it, exactly. If it's a classification, yeah, yeah, you're going to use the most common label. Yes, that's right. Yes. Yeah. And for example, in the second split, then we will calculate using yep. also this part. Exactly. Yep. That, that's how it's going to work. Yep. Yeah. And that's also how we get at the end the feature importance, I think. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the feature importance usually is going to follow that sequence of variables that you're going to have in decision tree. So probably the rule no is going to be our first one, right? Because it's the most, you know, is the is the minimum residual or the most the less impure, the, the most pure. Okay, yeah, you 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 are right with that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. What, what, one of the advantages of decision trees is that uh, they're e e easily explainable and also you can visualize them. Okay, uh, especially when they don't have that many variables. Of course, if we have a lot of variables, then you know. It grows in complexity because of the dimensionality. But if you have one, two, even three uh, variables explaining the the response, uh, you can you know uh, uh, usually portray the decision tree in a in a visual way. You know, very very effective. All right. All right. So okay. So how deep are we going to uh, you know construct? with decision tree, uh, making sure that we don't overfit or at least minimize that you know, overfitting uh, uh, situation, right? So there are two, two primary approaches to how you can control the depth of the tree. One is early study, okay? And the other one is called pruning. And we'll see you know, what pruning is, but let's first discuss the early study. So the early stopping, you can restrict the growth of tree in several ways, okay? Uh, one of the most common ways is to tell the algorithm, okay, I want you to construct a decision tree, but up to a certain level. And it's called, you know, the depth, okay? So for example, you can grow the tree to five levels, right? So you're going to have five levels and then you're going to have your uh, leaf nodes. But there's another way in terms of, and I explained this before, in terms of uh, what is the minimum uh, quantity of observations that you need in that terminal node, in that leaf node, okay? So for example, if you tell the algorithm in the argument that the leaf nodes have to have at least 10 observations, okay? 10 observations from the, you know, from the data set, then when it crosses that threshold, then it's going to start splitting, right? So that also controls the depth of the, of the tree. So more or less, those are the ones, and you can tune those parameters, okay? You can uh, do a, a cross-validation uh, 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 process so that you can tune to see you know, which are the ones from the training, and the, 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 the training and validation set within the training set you can tune that to see which is the optimal number for the levels and also for the uh, 
for the, for the terminal, you know, the minimum observation of the terminal nodes, okay? Which is, I think it's called minimum, uh, minimum number of, uh, in leaf, okay? Then that's the early stopping, right? And the other technique is called pruning. So pruning is a little bit more associated with, remember regularized regression? Okay, that we added a parameter to our objective function, cost function, which is the sum of squares in, ca in case of a regression, we added a penalty, right? Well, in this case, that's what we're doing here. We're adding what is called a cost complexity parameter that is going to be, uh, you know, affecting, right, the structure of the tree by adding a penalty to that cost function, all right? And also that parameter can be also tuned, all right? So the cost complexity works in the whole structure of the tree. The early stopping works uh, individually on the depth and also on the minimum observations for that terminal node or leaf node. Okay. Good. Yeah, all right. Okay. Okay, so let's try to see this in, you know, in, in, in action. So we already know our AIMS uh, housing example, you know, it's a data set collected from uh, uh, residential uh, sales in the AIMS, uh, in the AIMS city in Iowa. So uh, we start with our, you know, uh, reading, reading our uh, data set, right? With AIMS housing uh, uh, package. Then we do some stratified sampling, right? You know, we set a seed, we do the stratified sampling. 70% uh, is going to be on the training set and the test set is going to have the rest uh, 30%. Then this is the formula that you have to, you know, in base R, we're using the R part uh, package. This is the, you know, the, the sorry. Uh, you know, the instruction that you have to do to uh, do your decision tree. So you use our part, the function within that package. Uh, we tell them the formula, which is sell price as your response, and then take all the, all the, the, predict the variables as predictors. Uh, the data set is going to be the training set. And then the method is going to be ANOVA. Okay. And that's it. As you see, we haven't done any pre-processing. Uh, you know, transformation or anything like that is not necessary. Okay. And when you run this, you get the results, right, of your decision tree. And this is the, you know, uh, the, the root is going to be the, the root node and it's going to be the overall quality here. And then you're going to be go, going splitting through different variables depending on the, on the, uh, the sorting of that, you know, residual uh, uh, SSE. The sum of square errors. So neighborhood was, was the second one, and then the gross living value was the third and so forth. Okay, so the problem here is that it's kind of, you know, hard to interpret this, uh, you know, exposition in the, in the text form, right? That's why the R part has also a package called the R part dot plot that gives you a visualization of this decision tree. So let's see it. Okay, and this is the visualization. I'm going to zoom it. Okay, better now? Right? Yeah, I can. You can, you can, you can, you can, you know, make out the, <laughs> the text. Okay, so with that function, our part dot plot, uh, with the, you know, with our fitted, right? With our fitted uh, 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 object, we see, that the overall quantity is the root node, right? Is the one that has the minimum uh, 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 SSEs, uh, uh, sum of square errors for a particular value. And this is the value that is splitting, okay? So it's 181 uh, to the 10 to the three, okay? So it's going to be 181,000. That's the threshold. So anything, uh, let's say anything, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, 
I got confused. This is the this is the 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 uh, the, the value the, the value for the you know for for for, for the average because it's a quali quali uh, qu uh, qualitative uh, variable. What we have here is that the overall quantity is got split. Now we're we're getting somewhere. It's got split between the group that is very good and the rest of them. Okay, so this is the rest. Of the of the observations that have a qua a overall quality less than very good, okay? Because this is an ordinary ordinal variable, right? So everything that is not very good is going to be grouped in the left side, and then in the right side we're going to have the ones that are very good, okay? And this is the average of that group, okay? Three or three, the average of the total is one eighty one. And the average of that group that is not very good is going to be 156. Okay, so it's giving you the average of that cluster, right? So when we keep going, we see that the next variable in the left group is going to be neighborhoods. So the neighborhoods that are grouped within, you know, each of these labels is going to be then split. Then in the overall quality, very good, you're going to have a uh, gross living area, right? Okay, the gross living area, less than uh, 1957. And also you have another decision node of gross living area less than 129, okay? So everything between this is going to fall into this category. Anything more than that is going to fall into this. And then we see another uh, neighborhood indicator, which is the other group from this one. All right, so we keep following right the the splitting of those you know variables, and then we reach our uh, predictions. Okay, which are the terminal nodes. So, for example, if a new data comes, okay, that is very good, that the gross living area is more, okay, is uh, is more than 1957. Does it have the neighborhood? Uh, Edwards and Somerset and Vanker. Okay, then we go here, and then this is our prediction for that new observation. If we go to the other side, right? That is, let's say that the value is, uh, you know, the, the the condition is very poor, and it's in one of these, right? In one of these uh, uh, neighborhoods. Then we keep going until we reach our terminal terminal node. So these are the predictions depending on the composition of the variables for the for the, the new data, okay? So as you can see, because these are really averages of clusters, you know, within the, the feature space, there's going to be, you know, uh, some difference, you know, uh, unfortunately, there's going to be some difference between that value and the prediction. And that's why when we get a complex tree that we get, let's say a uh, hundred, uh, terminal nodes, 100 predictions, uh, is going to learn so well the training set that it won't generalize very well, you know, with new data. Okay, so as I said, it has to have a trade-off between the learning of the training set and the new data, you know, for the that is coming. Okay, uh, there's another package, okay, which I kind of like better in the visualization than the one that I show you which is a fancy R part plot, okay? And the good thing about this one is that uh, it, this one doesn't give you the number of observations that you're splitting. Here it gives you the information. So from the whole universe of 2049 observations, that is the training set, then you have in the first split, you have 348, you know, to the, to the left side, the no side, and one south and seven one uh, observations from the uh, yes side, okay? So it gives you more or less the split. And at the end, you see in the leaf nodes, you see how many observations uh, were gathered for it, okay? As you can see, there are some that has, for example, eight observations, all right? And some that had a lot, five, 12, et cetera. So this is not a very, you know, complex tree, right? They just have, you know, just a couple of couple of levels. Uh, so this tree should, you know, should uh, generalize, you know, our, our new data. 
our, our, our training test set. And we're, we're going to find out eventually. Okay. Uh, comments, questions. Oh, this is one good. of the things that I like, that I like about the decision trees that you can really <clears throat> know what's going on, you know, under the hood. Okay, go, go ahead, Kento. <laughs> No, oh, no, it's all, it's good because it's very straightforward as we know. So oh, yeah. yeah, it's a kind of a grouping. But the thing is, when we looking at the, this plot, actually, like uh, mm -hmm. in the in in this one is uh, just only eight k eight observations right. for this. So maybe it might be maybe truncated to come uh, too much, and then mm -hmm. maybe yeah, maybe we have to limiting some of the observation, but. We can right. testing it, those things actually later. So yeah, oh, it's yeah. good. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, okay. We, we can tune the parameter, the, the cost complexity, for example, for the pruning. Also, we can yeah. tune the depth. We can tune the minimum a number mm -hmm. in the in the leaf node, the terminal node. So yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. Okay, but here you have a good visualization of mm -hmm. how the decision tree is, is splitting your, mm -hmm. your your space, right? Your feature space. And also, how many observations are you are you handling within a split and then the terminal node? So this one I I, I prefer better this one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. So let's see how we can, you know, start uh, tuning, right? Uh, tuning your uh, our our uh, parameters, hyperparameters. Mm -hmm. So. There's a function within the R part, it's called plot CP, right? Which gives you at uh, the x-axis, it gives you the size of the tree here, okay? It gives you uh, the validation, uh, relative error, which is, you know, the, the sum of the, sum of the uh, square errors. And then some information about the CP, okay? Which is, which uh, it's aligned with the size tree. So for example, for size three of 10, okay? The size of three, which is the levels, okay? At 10, you have an associated uh, CP of 0 0.012, okay? And then you have this dotted line, which is kind of the optimum, uh, uh, you know, a, a relative error. So for example, if we use that, that was standard error rule, he says that a tree size of 10 to 12, which is the one that goes a little bit aligned or goes a little bit under that dotted line, uh, he says that provides the optimal cross-validation results. So our space that we're looking for the depth of the tree is going to be within this you know, range, okay? Okay, so we can what we can do is update, right? These parameters in our function, and we're going to use the control uh, argument to list as uh, zp0 and xval10. And with that, we're going to get this plot, right? Okay, we, we do the plot and we do the AB line for the V11. And we're going to get this plot and we'll see that definitely, you know, is confirming our, you know, our uh, finding here that this is uh, the optimum split for the you know, for the depth, uh, for, for the depth of, of the tree, the size of the, the tree, which is kind of, you know, in, in the range of 11, 11, uh, level 11, okay? And we have a table that also confirms that, right? So by default, our part is performing some automated tuning with that function, uh, the, you know, when we include this, uh, this control here, control arguments, uh, it says that with an optimal subtree of 10 total splits, 11 terminal nodes and a cross validation of SSE of this number, 0.2778, okay? Okay, so if we then do a cross validation, okay, because we're not doing cross validation here, right? Okay, we're just entering that XVAL and that CP into the decision tree uh, uh, parameter. But if we do a cross validation here, uh, now, uh, with uh, a, 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 a tune length, all right, tune length of 20, uh, 20, uh, you know, 20 different different values, 
uh, and we get this plot, okay? I use ggplot to get more interactive. And now we get the RMSE, okay? Which is the root mean square error from those, you know, from those sum of square errors. Uh, we get 20 different parameters according to the, you know, to the tune length. And the one that is giving us, you know, the less, the, the least RMSE is this one. Okay, with the cost complexity associated with cost complexity. So right now, if you want to know the best parameter for the CP, is going to be the number at the at the top of that you know tooltip, which is 0 0.0044786. Okay, and that's going to be your optimum cost complexity uh, number. All right. Okay. So let's continue. So for feature interpretation, uh, we get the from the function VIP, okay, variable importance. Uh, we can enter that uh, that fitted the the one that had the cross validation uh, results, okay, the the current cross validation AM, uh, AMS, AMS underscore DT three, that's the latest one, and we get because this is a different this is a different tree right this is a different tree than the one that we were you know originally uh, plotting which was dt1 so with this tree the gross living area is the one that has the you know the the most importance okay in other words you know it's it has the most splits in in terms of the decision nodes then we have total basement first floor gr build and so forth okay uh, if you do some partial dependency plots, which is uh, studying the behavior of uh, one of the predictors to the response, you know, according to the, you know, to the algorithm. So what we can see is that the, you know, the regions where the gross living is, if you, if you do the partial dependency plot on the gross living, you're going to see kind of a ladder, okay, a plot in which, for example, for uh, values less than 1,000, more or less, less than 1,000, you know, this is a little bit more, but let's say less than 1,000, uh, 1,100, uh, we get this, you know, uh, y, y hat, right, which is the prediction. Then from that value, so that value is going to jump to this value, okay, and so forth, 2,000, and then a little bit more, is going to have all this, right? And it's going to have that prediction. So we can see that in terms of the gross living area, sometimes there's a big you know, range of values that are going to have the same prediction. And that's where really the overfitting is, is happening, right? Because if you have a value that is a little bit lower in the lower range, they're going to have the same, you know, they're going to have the same prediction. So that's why, you know, decision trees are very understandable, very interpretable, but they, you know, usually don't give us the best, you know, the best uh, prediction, okay? And the same thing with GR bill. As you can see, GR bill only has uh, basically two splits, okay? One in the 1980, and it gives you this number, and then one uh, a little bit more than, than 1980, and it gives you a total different uh, prediction. Okay, so here you can visualize more or less, you know, how the the predictor is being handled by that, you know, particular decision tree. All right, and then you have a three D. Doesn't look very well here, but uh, you have a three D of the gross living area GR build and how, you know, the combination of them, you know, is giving you the white hat. All right, good, good, yeah, good, yeah. good. All right. Okay. So let's do another visualization to see how that uh, space has been uh, split. And, you know, uh, good for Angel that, you know, he, he, he preempted uh, this, uh, uh, this visualization. So let's take, let's take a look at the interaction between gross living area and total basement. These are the first two 
variables that are mo most important to that decision tree, okay? So let's plot that first, and this is the plot, okay? Those are the, you know, the scatter plot there on the intersection between gross living area and total basin uh, square feet. And then let's do a decision tree, right? With those, only those two predictors with the R part, and this is going to be the D4. Then we can use, and this is the, the package, the package is called part tree. And we can use part tree then with that, with those two dimensions to get a look at how the decision tree split that feature space between those two variables. Okay. So for example, here, what we see is that if the gross living area, right, is less than this number and the total basement square foot is less than, let's say 1,000, okay? The middle point between zero and 2,000, 1,000. Then all these points here, that's closer to points is going to have one prediction, okay? Which is going to, is going to be the average of this, of this observation in this space, okay? So let's take another example. If the gross living area is the same value, but then the total basement square foot increases by this value, then you, you are in this range, okay? And the cluster of these observations is going to give you an average that's going to be your prediction, okay? So here you can see visually how that feature space between those two predictors is partitioned and what is really the range of the values that you are dealing with, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, and of course, you know, in this one, which is one of the largest space, okay, uh, you're going to get an average. And as you can see, you're going to get points that are kind of far from the average, right? All these points, you know, in the, in the, in the corners are going to be away from the average. So that's going to give you a big, a big, uh, you know, residual uh, value, okay? Mm -hmm. And that, and hence, you know, that's the problem with the decision tree, the, the overfitting. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I have something else. Okay. So some final thoughts. Let's see if we have time. Uh, what time is it? Two forty-five. Okay. Uh, let's see if we have time for the for the for the attrition. Okay. I'll I'll try to do it briefly. So final thoughts. Uh, decision trees have a number of advantages, right? As you can see, they require very little pre-processing, if any. Uh, they also can handle categorical variables without pre-processing. We didn't pre-process any of the categorical variables that we you know, have in that uh, data set. Uh, the missing values can be handled with, uh, we have, you have to create new uh, variables that are kind of flags, okay? So for example, if you have a missing value in one of the, uh, in one of the categorical var variables, for example, you can, you can do flags, okay? So you can say, for example, when it's missing, uh, put a one in that new variable. If it's not missing, you put a zero, okay? And then you can input that into the model and it will, you know, it will, it will, it will give you what is called uh, surrogate uh, splits, okay? So it can handle. The, the, the thing is that you have to create uh, those, those variables, okay? For continuous, uh, uh, you have to do some uh, impurity. Okay, because you cannot use this uh, rule, uh, this flag rule. Okay, unless unless you can have you know a bunch of values that are the same, and then some of the missing values are outside that. We saw that in the screen porch, uh, a measurement that there was there were a lot of zeros, and then there was you know a, a couple of uh, a, a couple of uh, values above zero. So you could create that kind of flag. But usually this is for a categorical values, variables. Uh, however, however, uh, decision trees are not the state of the art, right? Uh, in terms of predictive uh, accuracy, it, it, they're prone to overfit. You know, uh, that, that's, part of the, that's part of the design, I guess. And furthermore, we saw that deep trees tend to have high variance, in other words, low bias. You know, it learned too much of the training set and then uh, they overfit on, on new, but the good thing is that decision trees are the basis for more complex algorithms that then cure this uh, this phenomenon. We're talking about random forest, right? And also we're talking about the gradient, uh, boosting algorithms. 
the basis for them is uh, the decision tree, of course. Okay. So let's try then uh, give you an example really quick. Give you an example of the of the classification. Uh, you know, using uh, decision trees, right? Uh, let me go here. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Okay. Let me get the directory. Good, 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 good. Okay, we're in chapter nine, and this is uh, decision trees. Uh, attrition. Okay, here we go. Okay, so we're going to use the attrition. Uh, we're going to use the decision tree on a, the attrition data that we have been, you know, uh, uh, working on uh, as, as an example of the classification uh, uh, model. Uh, okay, I'm going to be able to go a little bit faster. Okay, the attrition data, this is the data set. Okay, with the glimpse. Uh, so we have attrition, which is our response, and then all these uh, predictors. Um, let me do this. Okay, so let's do the splitting, right? Okay, and we're going to be stratifying by attrition to get the same distribution for the training and test. And we're going to do some foldings, right? So in K folds. All right, in the recipe, following the tidy models, in the recipe, the only thing that I'm doing here is because this classification is highly imbalanced. I'm doing from the library embed, I'm using this function, step of sample. So I can create more of a balanced class of sampling the minority class. In other words, the one that is the minority. And that's the basically the only preprocessing. The, the, the other function is zero barriers. So I'm going to eliminate any, any column, any variable that doesn't have uh, you know, have constant constant uh, values. In other words, it doesn't have any variance. Okay, so let's do the recipe. Let's say that the recipe is, is, is working for the training and the test set. Okay, then in the tidy models, we're going to do a, a specification for our model. We're going to use the decision tree, right? And we're going to high, uh, tune the happy parameters of cost complexity that we saw the tree depth and the minimum uh, values for the leaf node, okay? Using our part, using the same uh, package that we will be using for the, for the aims, all right? So we do this, this is our spec. We do the workflow, which is, it combines the tree spec with the recipe, okay? So that's why we need this function of the workflow in the tiny models. And we're going to use a grid to tell them, to tell the, 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 the model, you know, what, are, what is the range of those parameters? In cost complexity, we're not going to use any range. So, you know, the grid is going to automatically uh, uh, select random numbers for that. For the tree depth, we, we want from five to nine, okay, move from five to nine. And in the minimum nodes, we're going to move from 11 to 15, okay, the range from 11 to 15. And the levels, we're going to fix it to five, all right? Okay, so we got this grid, okay? And we got these values, okay, of cost complexity. This is a randomly assigned by the grid, the tree depth from five to nine, and the minimum nodes from 11 to 50, okay? Let's do the parallel processing, right? To, you know, <laughs> do it quickly. <laughs> Okay, and then we're going to tune our our tree. All right. Okay, it should take about ten seconds. Sometimes you know when we, we zoom with uh, you know with this uh, you know with this uh, parameter, it, it takes a little bit longer. So yeah, that right. can happen. Yeah. Okay. It it took eighteen seconds. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. So. Here we have the results, right, from our uh, tuning. And what we have is a, a, a list of three, you know, uh, of the three splits, right? You know, we have the, the, the three splits and we have everything that we need 
to calculate the, the metrics, the predictions, etc. Okay. So let's evaluate the model, right? And here, what we can uh, use it is for is for visually uh, seeing where is the optimal. Okay, we're doing accuracy and we're doing RO, uh, RO, ROC AUC, right? The the receivers. Uh, uh, characteristics, right? Operating characteristics, right? So, because it's an imbalance uh, class, I tend to be more concerned with the ROC AUC, not the accu accuracy, because the accuracy could be misleading. Okay, so as we can see, this is the range in in node size twelve. This is a range where you are maximizing, right? Your uh, RO, ROC AUC. Okay. And this corresponds to, I believe it's seven, three depth of seven, minimum no size of 12, and then the corresponding, right, cost complexity parameter, which is between these ranges, all right? So we're more or less, uh, the optimum tree is right here, okay? So let's collect some of the metrics, right? To make sure that we are in the, in the same page. And we see that the top model, because I'm ranging by the mean of the, you know, the ROC, okay, the ROC here and the mean of the of the splits, uh, we're seeing that we have a mean on 0 0.68, which corresponds to this value, and also we have the cost complexity. We have the three depth of seven, right? Three depth of seven here, and then we have the minimum nodes of twelve. Okay, so visually we can confirm that that is the, you know, the best model. Then what we're going to do now is take those parameters from the best model and then refit our, our, our tree you know, with the best hyperparameters. So we are going to show the best model, right? Get the best model, which is that one, the first one. And then we're going to finalize our tree, combining the workflow that we did with the best three uh, parameters that we have you know, uh, calculated. Right? We're not doing anything here so far. Then with those parameters, we're going to refit our training data using the test data. That's what our, our, you're using the split here, okay? For the final, the last fit, which is we're going to train it with the whole training set, but then we're going to compare it with the test uh, uh, data set, okay? So here we go. And you can see that the metric right now, you got a metric of 0 0.68 for the average of the best model in the training set. Now we get a 0 0.616. And that metric is from the test set, okay? So we fit it with the hyperparameters, we fit it our training set, the whole training set, and then we calculated the metrics with the test set. And as you can see, there's a difference. Uh, in terms of percentage, you can calculate it. Maybe it's around, I don't know, uh, 20, 30 percentage, but you can see obviously that there's an overfit problem. Okay. Mm. In other words, our model is getting too much information from that training set, and then it cannot generalize. And that's, you know, well, that's the problem with the, with the, uh, with the, with the uh, decision tree. Okay. We can get some variable importance, right? And here we get the monthly income, right? Is the most important, is the, is the one that is uh, used most in the splitting. Then you have job role, you have over time, you have days and so forth. Okay, and then we can do some confusion matrix, right? Because it's a classification. So in the confusion matrix for the taste data, you have 233 that are you know, uh, true negatives. True positives are here, 30, but then you have false, right? Uh, false negatives and false positives between 30 and 71, okay? So here uh, you have to see, you know, if this is the most optimal in terms of balance between the false positive and the false negative, okay? Uh, for the F1 metric, okay, we combine both of this, uh, you know, all the metrics in the uh, uh, confusion matrix uh, we have a measure of 0.825, which is not bad, okay? But, you know, it could be, it could be better. Uh, we have the ROC curve, right? 
So usually we want an ROC curve that is aligned to this corner, the, the one, right? And is away from this 0.5 because this 0.5 is really random, a random guess. In other words, if the model is too close to this line, it means that it's performing really poorly. So our model is performing good. You know, not very good, but good. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so let's do a, a final visualization on how do you, you visualize the decision tree. So what we do is that we extract the, this, this final tree uh, engine, okay? The engine, we extract it, and then we can use our rpad.plot with that object to uh, get the, the decision tree, all right? And as you can see, this decision tree is uh, is quite complex, right? <laughs> you know, compared to the one with uh, Ames. So maybe we should do some, you know, more study into this. Maybe combining predictors. We could, you know, see, you know, if we can combine predictors, or uh, you know, try to run with different with with different uh, levels. Because remember, we fixed the level at five. Maybe we can run it at four. Okay, and maybe we can get a better you know, a, a better model, all right? Yeah, maybe you have some correlated factors. Exactly. That you cannot mean, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. This is, a, you know, a, a, see it as a draft, okay? <laughs> see it as, mm -hmm. as a draft. There's still some work to be done. But of course, uh, don't do, dwell too much on the decision tree, okay? Uh, you can use other algorithms that we're going to be studying next that they're more powerful mm -hmm. than decision tree, okay? All right, so that's basically it. How we doing time? Okay, 2.59, hey, excellent. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> All right, guys.